So a lot of work in invasion ecology has focused on trying to um, identify traits linked with invasiveness. So this is really useful, not least because we can use it to inform biosecurity and weed risk assessment. So how do we do this? We go, we go about sort of identifying invasiveness traits by effectively classifying species either, as either non-invasive, which is ones on the left, and, and in, no, switch. Invasive and non-invasive, and this is the little girl is representing our non-invasive as she is non-threatening. Um, so people do this, but it, I guess it, what it does is it puts a lot of faith into how we break these two groups up. So obviously our alien invasives are here, and we use our non-invasive aliens or natives in the other sort of category, but still it could, this could invoke some uncertainty. So there's been some great insights developed through much of this work, not least by these papers. However, even within this absolute wealth of knowledge that we've generated, there's still a lot of um, inconsistency and uncertainty. So thinking of seed mass, for example, some studies have found that s large seeds, so large heavy seeds, are related with invasiveness. Others have found that small seeds are, and others have found there's no relationship whatsoever. So this sort of uh, raises questions about whether we're doing this in the right way and maybe whether or not these comparisons that we're making are sort of fair and robust. So to kind of get an idea about the sort of criteria that we, we use to identify invasive and non-invasive species, we looked across sort of 32 prominent um, sources or um, references, and these are academic policy, things like the IUCN, and databases. And it sort of boils down to these five uh, criteria. So I'm going to focus on the first four, and these are the dem what I'm going to call demographic dimensions because they relate to species abundance and distribution in the landscape. And then we've got impact at the bottom, and I can discuss afterwards why we, we don't actually focus on that one, if you like. So those of you familiar with um, ideas about uh, species rarity and some of the seminal work by Deborah Rubin Rubinowitz would notice that three of these four dimensions are actually used in her seven forms of rarity work. So she, she defined it as habitat specificity, which is our environmental range. She talked about geographic distribution, and she talked about local population size. And from this, you can basically have seven different ways a plant can be rare. So you could have ones which have low abundance, so in our bottom left. You could have ones which have a, a really narrow environmental range, or you could have ones that have all three, so that they've got a narrow geographic environmental and they're low abundance. We can switch this, of course, though, and talk about commonness as opposed to rarity, and this is where invasions make a nice leap, link in. So to this, we add our spread rate, um, uh, and then we've suddenly got our four demographic dimensions of invasiveness. And you'll notice that I've blocked out these ones because people don't ever specify that something has to be low abundance to be invasive. They, they just only specify whether it needs to be high abundance or not. I'm going to change this orientation a bit. We're basically saying, seeing the same thing, though. So this, whenever mustard is there, that means spread rate is invoked, so you've got to be a fast spreader. And then geographic geographic range, I'm sure you can follow it, and abundance. So we get our 15 forms of invasiveness. So we looked at, so I think arguably, you know, the paper that we all look at and go to these days for invasiveness traits is Van Clunen's um, great paper in 2010, which looked at invasive and non-invasive traits. And they did a meta-analysis of 118 studies. We looked at, we could only get definitions for 112, so we looked at those, and we looked at the definitions that underlie the classification of invasiveness in those 112 studies that underlie this big study. So Van Clunen sort of gave a definition of what they define invasive as, but like I have done, like others have done, we're quite broad and generous in our classification. So it sort of encompasses lots of things. And hopefully what you've gathered from this is that when you look at the individual uh, definitions underlying each of these studies, we see a whole spectrum in what we're classifying as invasive. So we do actually, this actually surprised me that we hit every single one of these boxes, but we are having 15 forms of invasiveness. So 66% of these studies specified that invasive species are dominant or reach high abundance, and 22% only used abundance as a uh, criteria. This is in contrast, though, to 25%, which didn't specify that a species had to be of high abundance. 
And I guess this raises uh, issues about how comparable, therefore, these, it is to compare these sorts of studies. And I sort of liken this to thinking about athletes. So um, if you, you could come up with traits that predict athletic ability or are associated with it, so body fat, for example, might be one. However, if you're trying to tease apart a gymnast and a rugby player, you'd be using quite different characteristics to separate the two. And maybe this is why we're running into problems. Maybe we're, we're predicting these different things among all of these different studies. So fortunately, um, because there are these lovely sub-disciplines called functional ecology, population and community ecology, we actually do know a little bit about what underlies these different demographic dimensions. And so I'm just going to put up some. I'm not saying these, these, are, these are facts or these are given, but these are sort of going through the literature. This seems to be what's associated with these different dimensions. And if we're breaking this down, so we're getting into mechanisms here, so thinking about what, what you need to, be, uh, to reach high local abundance. So in an undisturbed system, you are, might need to be a really good competitor, whereas in a disturbed system, rapid population increase, so classic colonizer traits would be important, and both would need to grow from a small population size, and we can match traits onto this. We can then begin to bring in these other dimensions, and I'm not going to go through all of these in detail for time reasons. Um, so we can think about, and some of these are shared, so some of the characteristics that relate to high abundance are also related to spread and so forth. But effectively what we see is this nice jig-jaggy uh, of an array of how things are related. But what, what I want you to note is um, some of these potential clashes that we're seeing across these different dimensions, and this is where we could be running into problems. So I've broken them into um, competitor traits and colonizer traits, so the latter in blue. And we can see that those, if you're assuming that a broad, well, broad environmental tolerance is linked with having a broad environmental range, you can see that perhaps being more competitive in your style and with slow leaf economics might be more linked with that, whereas it's going to be fast leaf economics with a rapid population increase. So we could have some contradictions there. Even within one of these dimensions, we can get contradictions. So um, reaching high abundance in an undisturbed, intact ecosystem is going to be quite different, and your characteristics is going to be quite different from those that reach high abundance along the edge of a road. But even within this, we can run into issues so growing from a small population size, so you know, it's good to have heavy seeds, well, we know that. It's also good to be highly fecund, we know that. But these two are inversely related. And seed mass is one of those really sticky traits that we run into in invasiveness studies, and perhaps this is why, because it's kind of inconsistent interpretation. Or maybe we just need some more useful covariates in our models. All of this is, oh, okay, so th there does seem to be evidence of this, I would suggest. So all of this is kind of moot in many ways if we effectively only use one dimension to begin with. You know, maybe people say they use fast spread and they use that as a criteria, but maybe it really only comes down to abundance after all. They, it may also be moot if all these dimensions are correlated, so everything is linked. So we're only hitting that really, really invasive category, so you're hitting all of those, those criteria. So how we went about sort of having a, a bit of a look and investigation into this was looking at um, invasive um, herbaceous species in Victoria. There wasn't enough woodies to work with. Um, and Victoria is southeastern Australia. It's about the size of the UK. And we used um, an invasive species classification that uh, defined invasive species as those that cause impact or are threatening to native vegetation. Um, and this was partly because um, this was the only classification that was useful, but um, also because it took out some circularity within our you know, if you're trying to predict high abundance using abundance, that's obviously a given. So the first thing that I'm going to show you now is these are correlations with some lovely symbols. Um, and what you can get from this is that, A, there's a, there's a strong correlation between geographic range size and environmental range size. No great surprises there. So that could suggest that at least one of these criteria, one of these dimensions could be axed. However, among the others, there's nothing really strong going on. And in particular, you know, we're seeing a really broad range. You just trust me on the scale. It does mean something. Um, so we've got um, uh, 
species that can be classified as invasive, so in some ways it doesn't even matter what colours they are, but the black ones are the invasive ones, and they tend to be clustered at the high end, but there's still plenty, you know, enough down the low end, so low, abundance, low abundant invasive species. So then we uh, took it to the next step, and we looked, we tried to, I guess, explain this classification done by different people to us of um, uh, which species are classified as invasive uh, whether we could explain it with these demographic dimensions. And we also, into these models, we added minimum resonance time of these species and also how far they are, are, are from the edge of a vegetation fragment. So this is fragments of native vegetation. So as you go into the interior of these fragments, because that would link with propagule pressure and sort of disturbance. So I'm just going to focus on the um, four demographic dimensions. Happy to discuss the other ones afterwards. Um, so for Forbes, we see that the only dimension that's coming out as important is high abundance. So the more abundant you are, the more likely you are to be classified as invasive. We see something pretty similar with the graminoids. Um, oh, I haven't changed the labels. Um, so again, high abundance is related to invasiveness of this scheme. Surprisingly, we get the opposite trend from what we'd expect with geographic range. So the broader your range, the less likely you are to be classified as invasive. And this is a bit puzzling, but perhaps what it is is about that, remembering this is sort of an impact threat-based classification scheme, so perhaps the, um, thanks, um, perhaps the uh, classifiers deemed sort of the ones with broad geographic range to be less of a threat because they've already filled their range. For this scheme, then we'd suggest that it would be probably worthwhile if you're trying to predict invasiveness for this, for this scheme that you might think about abundance traits. Which ones you choose um, is another matter. But basically, I guess what we're saying with, with this sort of work is maybe we need to get a bit more mechanistic and really disentangle and kind of say what we mean when we talk about invasiveness. This is, this is no new, new news, but um, for probably trait-based um, work it is. So one of my students, Essie Palmer, is looking at this and actually trying to link traits with these different dimensions, and we've got some other work going on in this space. And also just a little shout-out, Mark Rias and I at um, Southampton have a PhD advertised on something related, but also bringing in different types of organisms. So thank you. So you're asking whether we might use distribution size from the native range? Yeah. yeah, so I think we're really focusing on the invaded range. And so this is really, I guess it's not trying to predict the particular species we're using. It's using the species that have already invaded to try and inform the traits so that we can predict future invaders based on those traits, if that makes sense. So it's all about, this is all... It can't. Yeah, so you could, yeah, so you could, cer you could certainly do it that way, and that's assuming that the two are linked, which in many cases there are, they are, as work has shown, but in some cases they're, they're not. But the nice thing, and this is why we use traits, is because we can use what we've seen with invasions, look at those invasive species, work out what those traits are, and then we've got a profile of those invasive species, and then we can compare other species where we don't know their ranges yet, because we haven't seen them, but we do know their traits if that makes sense. Okay. I hope they'll be alright, and it's my pleasure okay. to introduce the other black ones.
Uh, thank you. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, the discovery of a new non-native species uh, using environmental DNA. So I'm going to give you a short overview about how we sample um, using environmental DNA and the, future, uh, the applications for those samples, and then a quick bit about um, a monitoring strategy that we've developed at the University of Hull for um, um, hopefully using those eDNA samples for the detection of alien invasive species. Um, that then, um, a little bit about the, the work that we did to discover Gamma Spasarum, so that strategy and practice, um, I could just point him out. Uh, this is Gamma Spasarum up here, um, not much to look at and perhaps a bit, little bit of like uh, Gamma Pulex in, in the UK already, but um, it's a new non-native that we've discovered with this work. Um, and then I'm going to give you a little bit about uh, the future development, about how we can um, uh, work on our strategy um, and hopefully um, um, use it for more invasive species detection. So, um, an environmental DNA sample, so a water sample essentially. Uh, this, the way you take the sample depends on very much on where you're sampling. So, if you're sampling um, in a pond or a lake, you might be doing some um, offshore or shoreline sampling. But I work mainly in rivers, so I'm I'm all about trying to um, take a sample that encompasses the uh, the distribution of DNA that's flowing down that catchment. So, I'm trying to take a, 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 a sample that encompasses um, everything that's going on, if you like. Um, what I do is I go out and I take um, three or four um, samples, like 400, 500 milliliter samples, and I pull them into a two liter bottle. So I take them across the river width, so we're, um, so we're taking that distribution into account when we, um, when we sample. I take them back to the lab, and within 24 hours I, I filter them through a, a 0.45 micron filter paper. So that's to, um, to take any available DNA that's on that, in that water and, and get onto that filter paper. Um, I, st I can store these filter papers um, in normal freezer in sterile conditions in a, in a Petri dish, and then I go on to extraction. So uh, at the University of Hull, we mainly use uh, power water extraction kits, but you can use kind of off-the-shelf um, extraction kits for this work. Um, then, I, then once you've got your, your clean DNA from your extraction, you can use it for, um, in, in two downstream methods. Uh, first of all, the targeted detection approach, where you design a species-specific primer, um, in this case, um, this is a quagga mussel. I work on um, a range of um, uh, non-native species. So I've designed a standard primer, and I've used um, um, a, an agro's gel to visualise whether I've got um, a positive detection or not in my water body. You could also use a QF PCR primer, and with that you can um, see if you've got your target DNA during the PCR process on, on the graph on the machine. You could also uh, do a passive detection approach, and this is when you use your, your, uh, your sa the same sample of DNA, but you screen for a whole community. So you use a universal primers to, um, to, um, to amplify that DNA. You use a PCR and create a library, and then use a next generation um, sequencing, like an Illumina platform, to see what, ki um, what species you've detected. So this can give you a, a long list of, of um, species, be it fish or amphibians, or in my case, macroinvertebrates. And uh, from that, it's a quite a powerful uh, biomonitoring tool that we're, we're kind of um, developing here. So um, I wanted to use that biomonitoring tool to uh, develop a way to detect specifically invasive species in rivers. So I used the uh, passive monitoring, so the metabarcoding approach, um, to uh, screen um, samples from high priority areas. If I detected anything, sorry about the formatting, um, I would then uh, go out and uh, collect a, a sample from the river to, um, to analyse to see if I've actually got that, that species in that sample. Um, I take it back to the lab, do uh, microscopy if it's, uh, if it's um, an invertebrate or um, an, an, an Isanga sequencing if I have any cryptic species. So that's when you take the specimen itself um, and uh, barcode it and you get the sequence back to, uh, to confirm that. And then, if possible, um, if it is a new um, invasive species, uh, implement any containment or, or eradication measures to hopefully eradicate that new invasive species. So, um, I decided to put this into practice. I went out to uh, 65 sites in eight catchments. I collected a traditional uh, kick net sample, so that's when you disturb the substrate um, and get all the invertebrates in the substrate in, a, in your net that's downstream. Um, I took that back to the lab and I carried out full uh, uh, mixed taxon level uh, microscopy, so that's all this to species wherever you can. I also decided that I'd, um, I'd uh, lyse the tissue sample, so I made like an invertebrate smoothie. So I, um, so I extracted a DNA sample from that just to compare with the microscopy to see if I was getting the same results from DNA as I was from my own microscopy. So I also collected the water sample um, in a similar way as I said before, and a sediment sample from across the river width. So sediment holds DNA in a different way to water, so I was, I was keen to see if the water and the sediment were different in, in how, um, what I was detecting. So I've got these four types of samples from my 65 sites. 
um, I used a Luray primer, which is, um, which is a macroinvertebrate-specific primer. Um, it amplifies um, that group of, um, of taxa, and I sequenced in-house at Hull, and then we did our own bioinformatics. And um, rather surprisingly, uh, we did discover, um, excitingly in, in, in some respects, because we didn't know about it, and it's a good example of the tool working, but we discovered a new non-native species, Gamerus fossarum. But what was more surprising is we, we discovered it in quite a wide, wide area. So we've got um, six out of the eight catchments that I went to, I found Gamerus fossarum. So it's all the way up to the Ribble in Lancashire. I say they're all the way up because I'm from down south, but we're just there, aren't we? Um, and I found it in um, the River Bain in Lincolnshire, uh, the two rivers Ely and Taff in South Wales, the Cone, which is a, a tributary of the Thames, and also in Dorset as well. So 26 out of our 65 sample sites we found uh, this new species that we hadn't detected before using our microscopy. Um, and interestingly enough, we found at four of those sites, we also had Gamerus uh, pulex. They exist quite happily um, on the continent where they're, where they're well, quite widespread. So it was um, really, really good to see that the uh, Fasarin wasn't, wasn't um, behaving in an invasive way. So um, I then wanted to go out and confirm I hadn't got any false positives and I wasn't you know, I wasn't getting this all very wrong. Um, so I collect, I, uh, this is the uh, meta barcoding data I got. Um, so it shows you the distribution of both Fasarum and Pulex um, specimens throughout the catchment. So you've got Fasarum mainly on the, on the main water body, and then you've got um, Pulex in the, in the purple triangles on the tributaries that come in. But interestingly enough, right in the middle, you have both species um, quite happily coexisting. It's mainly dominated by Fasarum, um, but it's quite a fast-flowing section of the river, and, and Fasarum prefers that kind of habitat, so, so maybe that's why we've got such a Fasarum-dominated habitat there. But once I was out, I uh, collected loads of gamrid, loads of species, and I took them back to the lab um, to um, confirm my identification. So because this is quite a cryptic set of species, I, I decided to do both uh, Sanger sequencing, so again, uh, sequencing the specimen, sending it off and getting the, the barcode back, also um, the morphology, so here you're looking at, at um, Eurozone 3, which is at the tail end of the Gamerus. You're looking at the relationship between the um, endopod and the exopod. I should say there are other features, but these are kind of the key ones that we look at at the moment. Um, we are looking at whether the, um, endo e the endopod is more than 50% of the exopod. So this is Gamerus um, uh, pulex in the blue, and then Gamerus fossarum in the black. Um, and you can see that the uh, endopod is much less, much smaller as well than the, um, than the exopod there. So another key feature is the plumous hairs, and this one is uh, quite tricky. Um, plumous hairs are feather-like hairs that you find on the, um, the endopod. In Gamerus uh, pulex, they're both on the inside and the outside of the endopod, whereas in Gamerus fissarum, they're just on the inside of the endopod. And uh, a bit of uh, tinfoil scrunched up underneath your specimen helps with that ID, in case you need any help. <laughs> so coming on to our, um, back to our um, invasive monitoring strategy, so we've gone out and we, and we found, um, you know, we go out, we found our specimen, we ID it, and then we hopefully, you know, can um, contain it. We obviously can't contain Fasarum because it's so widespread and quite common. But if, for any instance, you don't, you, you don't find it, this is where species-specific primers can come in and you can use perhaps a more sensitive approach to detect your, your target species that you've detected in your passive monitoring. So this is a yeah this is the kind of flow diagram that I'm working on at the moment about how we can we can we can detect all these different species and um, hopefully you know an early warning system. So uh, in conclusion, um, this is a really nice story about how env environmental DNA can work in the field. I think it shows um, the potential for this tool. It's quite powerful, and uh, as I said, it, it, it surprisingly enough we found a new non-native. Although it wasn't, it's not thought to be an invasive. This kind of shows the potential for the future, and um, hopefully uh, we can look at monitoring pathways or perhaps uh, ballast water or or kit on site to see whether we can detect any new non-natives uh, before they become established in the field. But I think it's uh, important to uh, reiterate the fact that uh, visual verification is key to, to remove any chance of false positives. Um, so um, going out and getting into the field and actually getting your specimen is quite key to this. Um, so with that, I'd just like to thank um, all the staff at the agency and Natural Resources Wales that helped me and my field, uh, field help and everyone at Hull that, that helped me with the lab work to confirm this new species. So yeah, that's it. Any questions? <laughs>
um, well, I think um, so. Gen Bank, is, as a public library, is very big, very extensive, but a lot of work needs to. No, it's not curated. So um, we we're trying to have our own kind of reference library for our own tax on, just to make sure we've got proper things because we have to double check everything on GenBank to make sure we're, we're getting the correct species. That's why I was so keen to do so many checks on Fasarum just in case someone hadn't put a Pulex on and it had been recorded at Fasarum. But I think there's a lot of work to do with reference database still to be done. But um, you can sequence stuff and see what it comes back as. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so. Yeah, so um, we mainly, yeah, we mainly do water samples, but it does work on soil samples. I did detect fasarum in soil as well. Um, it's quite different because soil behaves so differently. So you get a lot of ancient um, DNA still attached. So, in, in terms of invasive species, that's fine because hopefully it's there or it's not there. But if you were kind of like checking it gone, you might still have DNA kind of present. But yeah, it should it should work with soil as well, but. Main focus would be water, I guess. Yeah. And what about things that are very small that we don't know? They may be got this DNA sequencing. I guess that's another thing is that because because Fasarum is so widespread and common, um, I want to do some more work to see has it just been missed for so long. I'm I'm keen to kind of look into that. I w at the Natural History Museum, I found a specimen from 1964 mm -hmm. last week. So I want to do more to find out what actually is native. I think that's what eDNA shows us. It's kind of a lot of potential to find out all these new things that we didn't know before. So it's, it's quite cool. So yeah, I think. <laughs> F5, did you say? Yeah. Okay. I think that touches images and stuff, so I'll change my slide. I'll change it on the screen. Okay. The, the, uh, was yours four three or yours yours? Yeah. yeah. So I'll just change yours to sixteen nine, and I'll have to change it on the other one as well. Okay. Well, you still have to sign in there. We try and take yours before you do it. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We may just start on the next talk um, with um, Sarah Khan talking about um, starfish larvae and the end. <laughs> Thank you. So I'll be talking about predation on the early life stages of the crown of thorns starfish, um, specifically the larval stage by damsel fishes, and I'm going to be using the acronym COTS when referring to the crown of thorns starfish. So COTS are best known for their massive population explosions or outbreaks, which are defined as any large aggregation of hundreds or thousands of individuals 
which um, can persist at high densities for months or years and cause extensive coral morta mortality over large areas of reef. Um, these outbreaks are prevalent throughout the Indo-Pacific, as you can see from all the black dots on this bottom figure, and they're identified as a major cause of coral loss across this region, as the starfish pre feed predominantly on reef-building corals. So on the Great Barrier Reef, mean coral cover has been declining since the 1960s, and predation by cots is identified as one of the primary drivers of this decline. And um, it, these outbreaks have accounted for approximately 40% of the loss between uh, 1990 and 2010. So the first COTS outbreak was in the 1960s, and since then these have been occurring cyclically roughly every 15 years, with the Great Barrier Reef currently experiencing its fourth recorded outbreak. So there have been a number of hypotheses put forward to explain why these outbreaks occur, and the leading two hypotheses, nutrient enrichment and then predator removal, which um, my work focuses on, both attribute outbreaks to anthropogenic causes. So the predator removal hypothesis was the first hypothesis put forward to account for COTS outbreaks. It proposes that overfishing of key predators has allowed starfish populations to increase to abnormal densities, and this hypothesis has gained recent support from reports of increased frequency or severity of outbreaks in areas that have been subject to fisheries exploitation. The scientific interest in predation upon COTS has primarily focused upon the post-settlement life stages, and this revealed a number of potentially key predators, um, such as fish species, which are represented by the blue bars, um, and includes triggerfish, pufferfish, and emperors, and a number of invertebrate species, which are represented by the pink bars, and this includes um, the giant triton, the harlequin shrimp, and the lion fireworm. Um, it's thought that these predators normally maintain cots populations at low density, non-outbreak levels, but um, removal through overfishing or general reef degradation may have drastically reduced the rates of predation and adult mortality contributing to these population outbreaks that cots are infamous for. Predatory regulation might equally occur during spawning and at um, the pre-settlement and settlement stages, however, as cots are highly fecund. Uh, so relatively small changes to the rates of predation at these stages would produce um, very large changes in the proportion of survivors through to adulthood. As you can see, though, few predators have been identified at these life stages, and this is primarily due to logistical challenges of sampling these early life stages. Um, but also, cots are chemically defended at all, life, all stages of their life cycle, um, and it was once thought that um, these eggs and larvae were effectively defended from predation. Uh, there is some evidence, however, that these gametes and larvae might be consumed in large numbers by planktivores, and this includes by planktivorous damselfish. So on coral reefs, uh, planktivorous damselfish are highly efficient predators that are capable of removing a large proportion of the zooplankton from near reef waters. So if these planktivorous fish readily consume the eggs and larvae of cots, then their high densities and high feeding rates may significantly influence the reproductive and settlement success of this starfish. So to establish whether planktivorous reef fish could be important in regulating abundance and or contributing to these extreme fluctuations in abundance of cots, I used these 10 species of damselfish as predators, and I tested the consumption rate of larvae of cots versus larvae of another common coral reef starfish, Linky levigata, which is the blue starfish. Um, I use this as a comparative species because it co-occurs with cots. It has a similar larval developmental pattern and while it's generally um, very common, it doesn't exhibit the same um, extreme fluctuations in population size that we see in cots. So if predation activity upon cots is much reduced compared to these other starfish, this might explain why cots exhibit these outbreaks. So then to examine the extent to which these predators may potentially regulate abundance of cots or respond to changes in their abundance, I then determine the predatory behavior of these damselfish feeding across a range of, dens a range of densities of cots, and this is described by the function response. So to answer my first objective, I fed each of my fish with either 100 cots larvae, which are highlighted in yellow on the left, or 100 linkia, which are highlighted in blue on the right. I left my fish to feed for an hour, and then I removed them and count the number of remaining uneaten larvae. So then this figure shows the mean number of larvae consumed per predator for each fish species, with cots represented by the yellow bars and linkia by the blue bars. 
Um, as you can see, there's no significant difference between consumption rates for most of the um, species, and only one species actually consume cots at a lower rate than it consumed linkia, and two actually consume cots at higher rates than they consume linkia. So this suggests that planktivorous fish do actually prey upon um, cots larvae, and they may play an important role in reducing the number of larvae that successfully settle onto the reef. So then the potential ecological importance of planktivorous fish predation as a regulatory factor upon cots populations depends largely upon the ability of these predators to find and consume the larvae. So this brings me to the second objective. So examining the functional response of predators is a common method that provides insight into the dynamics of predator-prey systems. And these functional responses are defined by the intake rate of prey as a function of prey density. And they determine the extent to which predators um, may potentially regulate prey abundance or respond to changes in the prey abundance. So these, um, these functional responses can be categorized as type 1, type 2, or type 3. But um, I'll only be focusing on these type 2 and type 3 responses because predators that exhibit these types of response might be capable, capable of breaking up an aggregation in its early stages. So the type 2 functional response is defined by a feeding rate that increases at a decelerating rate towards a satiation point. Um, and it assumes that handling time and searching time are mutually exclusive. And it typically describes the foraging behavior of species that are capable of handling only one prey item at a time, and where there are no increases in capture success with increases in the rate of encounter for given prey items. And then the type 3 functional response describes a feeding rate that initially increases with increasing prey densities, and then it decelerates towards a maximum value, and that produces this characteristic sigmoidal curve. So this pattern is produced by factors that affect the probability of detection or attack of prey items. Um, this includes learned behavior, prey switching, increasing capture success, or aggregation of prey. And predators that exhibit this type of function response are likely to be disproportionately important in reducing um, numbers of cots as the densities increase. So for example, during a mass influx of larvae. So then to establish a potential role of predators in regulating survivorship and abundance of larval cots, I explored the functional relationship between predation rates and densities of starfish larvae by feeding my fish with cots larvae at a range of different densities. And again, I left them to feed for an hour and then removed my fish and I counted the number of remaining larvae. And I then plotted this against the initial prey density and ran some analyses to see which type of functional response best fitted the observed patterns of predation. So for one species, um, the analyses suggested um, a type three response. So the feeding rate increases with increasing prey density. So this species is also um, really abundant on coral reefs. And then remember also that it um, consumed cots at a higher rate to other starfish species. So this suggests that um, this predator could be really important in reducing high densities of larval cots. For most of my species, however, I found that predation activity is best described by the type two functional response. And um, due to the implied high predation rates, um, upon the larvae occurring at low densities, this type of response suggests that these predators may be important um, in effectively suppressing recruitment rates when the larvae are at normal low densities. Um, so these predators might contribute to the, contribute to the um, very low natural densities of cots. And then the asymptote of the fitted model can also be used to answer questions such as just how many larvae can these fish eat? And um, this, uh, these satiation limits were really variable between my species, but um, reveals predators such as Dacillus arowanus, which can consume approximately 150 larvae per hour, um, Acurisau and Crisiptera velandi, which can consume approximately 60 larvae per hour, and Dacillus reticulatus and Pomocentris molokensis, which can consume approximately 50 larvae per hour. And then the attack rate, which describes the initial slope of the function response curve and also tells us about the strength of the predator, can also be extracted from these fitted functional response models. And a higher attack rate parameter indicates that predators consume more prey at lower densities. Uh, so these are also found to be highly variable between the species. <coughs> 
with Dacil sarawanus and A. curacao emerging as the most important predators in reducing effective settlement rates when the cots are at normal low densities. So as well as having high initial attack rates, these two species also had high satiation limits, and then A. curacao also preferred cots to the other starfish, and um, it's also highly abundant. So this really reinforces the importance of these species as potentially key predators of larval cots. Uh, so then just to summarize, um, damselfish will readily consume cots larvae and each individual fish is capable of consuming hundreds of larvae before becoming satiated. Uh, the fish considered in this study exhibited primarily type two function responses. So this suggests that they may be capable of consuming enough larvae to effectively suppress settlement rates, especially outside of outbreak periods when the starfish are in low abundance. And so they may contribute to very low natural densities of cots. Although a mass larval influx, which would be necessary for um, the rapid and pronounced onset of outbreaks, is likely to swamp the combined consumption capacity of all these fish, um, high densities of planktivorous fish, and especially those that selecti selectively um, target cots and are capable of eating very large numbers, and those with higher initial attack rates um, are likely to be disproportionately important in reducing sediment rates and contributing to the low natural densities of cots. Um, and they may also be important in reducing the incidence of new outbreaks. Um, several of the damselfish considered in the study are extremely vulnerable to coral depletion, however. So any threats to the abundance or composition of um, planktivorous fish assemblages may give rise to new outbreaks of cots. And this points to a potentially important feedback loop where high cots densities um, may uh, effectively remove essential habitat for coral dwelling reef fish, leading to increased larval survival, higher numbers of adult cots, and um, ever greater coral loss. Um, so I just want to acknowledge my funding body, supervisors, and all my helpers. Um, and this paper's published in Coral Reefs, and there's also a blog on my funding body website if anyone's interested in some more information. Thank you. So they're all um, wild caught. Um, potentially, that could be um, a way of managing outbreaks, but um, um, I guess it's sort of more important to look at why these populations might be decreasing. So um, yeah, like rather than just releasing more damselfish, we want we want to reduce the stresses on them. So, um, but potentially. So I've tested, um, I'm sort of still analyzing the data, but I've run them um, also feeding them at the same time and also against um, a sea urchin, um, but I'm still analyzing that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so it could be a lot of different factors. So a lot of them are quite associated with the corals. So um, they use it for habitat or protection from predators. So um, basically, if you get something that um, destroys the corals, like maybe um, a cyclone or bleaching kills their habitat and they have nowhere to live, you're then going to get lower densities of damselfish. Um, and it still would need to be tested, but then that can potentially, if you haven't got predators eating the larvae that are then coming in to settle, um, you'd expect there to be much higher densities of um, settling larvae. Thank you very much. Sorry. Thanks. Right. I'm trying a quick projector change. Oh, are we going to, for this one? Or, hang on, let's see how it goes. <laughs> 
Hi, uh, so I'm going to be talking about some of the, the work that myself and my supervisor Stephen Cornell have been doing of late. So many people in this room will know that when it comes to biological invasions, in test, uh, investigating these invasions can be very impractical, can be difficult and expensive uh, to do this physically. So what we do is, is we come down to uh, theoretical uh, predictions and <coughs> testing through simulations. And some of the early work on theoretical invasions was done by Fisher and Skellum, in which they had found a mathematical expression for the speed of invasion based on the reproductive growth rate and the diffusion coefficient. So just like any scientific theory that tests, uh, that needs to be tested, things have moved on, and we now know that different aspects can influence this. So we have, for example, uh, alley effects and environmental heterogeneity also influence invasion speed. But what isn't actually well known or is unclear is how polymorphism in, impacts invasion speeds. So the classical framework tends to use monomorphic populations, so sort of one sort of phenotype. But this isn't often the case, and sometimes, to use an extreme example, we can think of wind dimorphism within crickets. So you sometimes have a highly dispersive and low fecundity morph and a high, f high reproduction and low dispersive morph. But can you, can you model these as the same population? Um, should we take a look at, at investigating this? So since anomalous invasion speeds are actually mentioned in the title, it should be worth saying something about them. So this is when uh, an invasion speed can move faster in the presence of another species, but in our case, phenotype. So sometimes you'll have, say, a different, uh, again, so a different phenotype will, uh, will uh, the presence will make it go faster. So for the, for example, here we have the, an establisher morph uh, in isolation and a dispersal morph in isolation. And in this graph here, we have them both in the same population, which can be seen from the equilibrium value. And on the bottom here, we have position in space. So it's important that I explain this because you're going to see a lot of these graphs. So these are generally found, or they have been found, in cooperative systems, <coughs> such uh, which to explain cooperative means each species of phenotype has a positive effect on the other. But in the Elliott Cornell system, and by extension, our system is a non cooperative system. It's set to have very low density. And the anomalous invasion speeds were found to exist here. So what our aims were was to see, okay, it was true for dimorphic populations, but what if there's three phenotypes, or 10 phenotypes, or 1,000? So we want to know what happens when we extend this system to N phenotypes in the population. Do we still see anomalous invasion speeds? And if so, what do they look like? And, or do we see something else entirely, and the dimorphic case is just a special case? Um, so we extended this using partial differential equations. So here we have the first equation of the day, and it's the only one. Uh -huh. So for those who aren't familiar with partial differential equations, this is the population change in time. I here would be the particular phenotype that you were interested in. Here we have the dispersal and our lot of Volterra growth. So this is just diffusive. Um, R here is our intrinsic rate of growth, and C here is our competitor or competition terms between and phenotypes. And coming at the end here is our mutation dynamic. So we would have, say, if you were in phenotype I, uh, at birth you have a constant proportion will change from the parent phenotype into the others and come out. And similarly, for every other phenotype, you will have um, morphs coming in. And on the population, so this is a haploid asexual population polymorphic at one locus, and at this locus, the genotype is expressed as a distinct phenotype in this case. So if you change phenotype, you change your dispersal, which is your diffusion constant, your intrinsic rate of growth, and your competition coefficient. Um, but after, so 
I'll just present some of the results now, uh, rather than the analysis. So we uncovered two invasion speeds here. So we have, for those familiar, this is the Fisher equation, uh, the Fisher speed, where L here is any particular choice of phenotype. And to the right is the anomalous uh, invasion speed, where M is also another uh, choice of phenotype. And that's interesting here, it's quite remarkable, because it's still only two. Now this is still an N system, so it, it's still only dependent on two phenotypes uh, at most. Um, which it, so there's no other contribution from any other, other moths, which we found very surprising. Um, and we refer to these as Vanguard phenotypes because we find them at low densities at the very front of the wave. But, okay, so there are two, but you've still got an N population. So how do we choose which ones uh, are leading the invasion? So out of the analysis came out this relation here. Um, these two conditions must be satisfied uh, simultaneously. If they're not satisfied simultaneously, you will fall in here. So one, if you satisfy only one or none, you'll land in this region, in which case the entire population will travel at the Fisher speed. But if not, you can travel at the anomalous invasion speed. So biologically, this can sort of be expressed as your, few, your dispersal abilities must be at about approximately twice as large as your reproductive. But enough about the analysis here, and um, we'll get into simulations. So this slide is a lot going on. So we tested this through simulations. Um, we used some parameter values which have shown up quite small here, but there are 10 phenotypes in our population from right to left, increasing in dispersal ability and decreasing in reproductive ability. So in the top, uh, on the right column here, we see the population advancing in the traveling wave from left to right. And, and on the left column here, we see the invasion speeds. So the blue line up here is actually um, the anomalous speed. The green line is the Fisher speed. So what we see, and the important part, is that this contains all 10 phenotypes. It's very difficult to see because they all lie on top of one another in this red line. They're very, very close together. But interestingly here, this is, this, this is a population that contains only phenotypes 1 in 10, which we found to be the anomalous, uh, the anomalous invasion speed. And it's traveling at the same speed. So like our mathematical predictions, our simulations seem to be backing this up. And here is one phenotype by itself, um, evading at the, the, the Fisher speed. And all of these values were selected in such a way that any phenotype in isolation would be, um, would be traveling at Fisher speed of two. So we find that the Vanguard phenotypes will travel at the same speed uh, in any of the populations. Now, if you notice here as well, there's all, all, of the all of the population, all of the phenotypes are still at the front. So we still have uh, diversity being maintained um, despite no frequency dependent selection, which is important. Um, so some additional sort of questions that come out of this. Um, we have, from there we've seen that the the phenotypes 1 and 10, which happen to be the most fecund and the most dispersive. Intuitively, that, might, that makes some sense. You, th you find that the, the, you would think that the most dispersive was at, was at the front. There's a little bit of mutation that takes you into the greater reproducer and the, the exponential growth takes you up. And you get this little knock-on effect you could expect. But this isn't always the case, as we find, and the math tells us that that's not the case. So we decide to take a look at a, another example. Um, so here we have instead numbered from left to right, um, six phenotypes. So we have one and six at the end here, which are the most fecund and the most dispersive. But we also have phenotypes two and five. And these are the phenotypes that we predict through the analysis to be the anomalous invasion speeds. So here on the top, again, just like the previous, we have a density on the side here, um, all six phenotypes, and again, the blue line for anomalous phenotypes, and the, the, anom the anomalous speed, sorry, and the green line being the uh, Fisher speed. Again, we see everything at the front. Uh, we see 
all six travelling at the same speed again as phenotypes two and five. But here, which is quite quite difficult to see, is that the the most fecund and the most dispersive are are travelling slower, um, which which is which is we were not actually entirely sure why <laughs> as such. Um, but again, we still see that uh, diversity is maintained uh, at the front of the wave. Um, so here we have some notes regarding uh, anomalous invasion speeds. Um, we found that those that satisfied the condition, it was it was always the fastest that we found. Um, regardless of these of these types, um, we do have a mathematical explanation for this, but we don't have a biological explanation for this. Um, <laughs> the jury's still out on this, I'm afraid. Um, but we do also have evidence which isn't covered here that the tr the the role of the trade-off between the traits uh, actually has a big impact on how this is done. On, on the invasion speeds. Um, so, conclusions to be to be drawn here are that if there's anything you take away from this talk, uh, it should be that the speed of invasion is determined by at most two of the constituent phenotypes of the population. Um, the vanguard phenotypes need not be the most dispersive nor the most fecund, and we still maintain diversity without frequency dependent selection. Um, as again, this this wasn't included, and it does ha it does actually have an effect um, on the invasion speed. But I'd also like to take some acknowledgements um, for my supervisors in Un in Liverpool, Stephen Cornell and Alex Sikieri, and my supervisor in York, Jane Hill. Um, and. Thank you for, for your time. I probably missed it. Could you explain a bit more about the genetics of the, um, of the system? Because in most of these bush cricket, long wingedness is, for example, a freckle. Yes. Okay. So. so with regards to the crickets, it's only a, 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 a sort of explanatory way of, of describing this. So in this example, um, if I had more time, I could go over some of it. We make a more realistic mutation. So at birth, any of the individuals will mutate from the parent genotype into any of the other genotypes. Um, so, but the, we, it's also theoretical population, so that it's not based on any data. Um, so we have sort of a haploid um, asexual population. But we also do, we have actually tested this, it is robust to, um, if you have, would say, the nearest phenotype, as in what you would maybe expect realistically. You wouldn't make a, you wouldn't go from, say, being the most dispersive to being the most fecund, just like that. There is, there is like, we, we did model this. And it actually changes the, the, the profile of that weight. Um, it's a, like a more lathered effect, is what you, is what you see. Yes. So <laughs> it might not it might not be the easiest one to, to, to say um, quickly, but uh, yeah, 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 we we, we can do that because it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of deep question that it's, it's in the analysis. It's not there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
I am. Uh, what I'm going to present is uh, like a, a whistle-stop tour through a number of projects uh, I conducted over the last four years in Northern Ireland, looking at the impacts of brown hairs on endemic Irish hairs. So it's going to be light on methodological detail, uh, but there should be a number of things for you to consider with regards to invasive ecology and how people respond to that, and I'm happy to discuss anything you want afterwards. Uh, so Lepus europaeus, European hair, native to Europe and the Asian steppes. Uh, in the native range, populations declined due to agricultural intensification, but it's been introduced to a large number of countries and islands worldwide, and it's considered globally invasive as, is, as it often displaces ecological competitors, for example, mountain hares in Sweden or Mara, a large rodent in Patagonia. They were introduced to Ireland in the 1800s for the field sport of hair coursing. Uh, many of the introduced populations failed to take, um, and there's one large population remaining in mid Ulster here. Uh, origin unknown, we don't have a date or origin source for that. Um, and that's actually uh, my study, that was my study area. And then we have the Irish hare, uh, Lepus timidus hibernicus, which is a subspecies of mountain hare. Mountain hares have a circoarctic circo uh, distribution. They're uh, an upland species in contrast to the lowland European hare. Uh, it's Ireland's only endemic legomorph, and it has evolved in isolation for about 30,000 years since the last glacial maximum, and as such has uh, considerable ecological plasticity. There have been no, there's been no competition. So it's found from the tops of mountains right down to the seashore. Uh, it's considered to be unique. Uh, it has unique genetic, uh, genetic uh, profiles, uh, unique behavior, and it's increasingly considered to be uh, potentially a separate species as it was originally. Uh, it's undergone a population decline due to uh, agriculture and agricultural intensification and changes in land management in Ireland, and as such as a species of conservation concern subject to national and international pieces of legislation. I say the European hares are unique, uh, unique, sorry, and the literature suggests that it's actually very similar to the European hare. Um, so the first thing I want to do is explore this in a European context, find out whether the Irish hare is distinct from other mountain hares and how close it is to the European hare. And to do that, constructed uh, species distribution models across Europe, so comparing the Irish hare not only to the European hare, but to the two northern hares, uh, Timulus timidus and Timulus sylvaticus, um, and the Alpine and Scottish hares, Timidus scoticus and Timidus uh, varonis. I collected over a quarter of a million presence records from across Europe. Obviously, there were, uh, some, are, some areas are pat patchier than others. And used bioclimatic and habitat data, which, after accounting for collinearity and permutation importance, whittled it down to about 10 variables. And the models actually performed very well. Uh, the lack of data in places like France and Western Europe affected uh, projections a little, but uh, AUCs and TSS statistics and other model evaluation metrics uh, showed that they were actually quite good models. So we took all these uh, 10 variables and compressed them into principal components. And this is just one graph of many, but, but basically what this shows is when uh, you plot the principal, principal components together, and these are PC1 and PC2, so most of the variation is shown here, Irish hairs often separate out. Uh, and what's also interesting is we have the Fennoscandian species here and the Scottish and Alpine public, uh, species here. So there, there are little discrete groups of uh, ha uh, hair ecology. Uh, and other PC combinations showed the Irish hairs increasingly closer to European hairs. So we took these PCs and looked at ecolo uh, ecological distance. Uh, so this is two-dimensional distance, uh, Mahalnobis distances. And in these graphs, uh, the gray bars represent all mountain hare subspecies, including the titular species, the white bars excluding that species. And what this basically shows is that Irish hares are ecologically different to other mountain hares. Scottish hares, not so much. Uh, and the Irish hares are the only species in which we see this significant difference. Uh, there are reasons for this, which I'll come to in a minute, uh, or potential reasons. But we also see the same thing in nth dimensional space when we look at Euclidean distances across multiple principal components. So we've got an idea that Irish hares might be ecologically distinct from other mountain hares. Um, but, uh, and, they're actually, and they do appear to be close to European hares according to uh, pairwise principal component plottings uh, and distance analyses. Uh, so we decided to look at uh, projections in the future under climate change scenarios, and on top we have Irish hair models. Down below we have European hair, and what you can see at the present time, all of Ireland is suitable for the Irish hair, as you'd expect, they're found across the island. 
And by the 2050s and 2070s, much of Ireland becomes unsuitable uh, with Irish hares found in the west and extreme west and south. And the opposite is true of European hares. They rapidly expand across Ireland with conditions becoming more favorable. Now, these models have to be taken uh, with caution. Uh, the European hare models are quite, uh, should be quite robust. That data is drawn from across Europe. Uh, the Irish hare data are only modern, uh, and modern cl uh, climate projections only include climatological data, nothing about landscape. Ireland is a very homogenous uh, country. The weather doesn't change that much from east to west, really. There's not that much variation. And much of the landscape, 75% uh, of the landscape is small, small agricultural fields. So it's highly likely that the projected models vastly underestimate the Irish hare's potential for adaptation. There are no, uh, there are no biological, uh, in, well, hare-related biological components in those models. So they are, they do need to be taken with a note of caution. But what these do show is that uh, if the Irish hare is more adaptable and remains across much of Ireland, then there's going to be uh, interspecific competition for resources. And we want to see whether that was true on a more local scale, because this is quite coarse. So we constructed habitat suitability models using model averaging techniques uh, and multiple spatial scales. So we used uh, hare presence points and pseudo absences. Uh, and um, um, a number of potential variables, so land class data and so on. And what we usually do in this case is construct individual models for each variable for each species to tease out uh, the, the distance at which the species react uh, best, for want of a better term, to each variable. Uh, and we did that at first, but what we found when we examined the data more closely was that this actually masked species uh, similarities. So these are just some of the variables. Uh, like see, um, with Moran Z, which is spatial autocorrelation, there are differences. But along, um, through much of them, like improved grassland, rough grassland, uh, the, when we came to do individual species models, apparently there were differences. But really, are there? They both react very similarly. Oh, dear. OK. Um, so we combined the species and put one distance into all models. And this is what we got. So there are a lot of similarities, but some key differences. European hares prefer uh, rougher, uh, they're, well, they're more resilient to rougher quality forage, uh, prefer smaller fields with field edges. Irish hares are the opposite. They prefer s soft agricultural gra grasses. But niche overlap was almost entirely complete. So the European hare is a threat to Irish hare security, uh, ecological security. There's a lot of potential for competition there. Uh, so we went, then wanted to look at changes in range and abundance. The first survey was done in 2006. 2012-13 expanded upon this. And what we found was that the core range had doubled with a high consolidation of European hair uh, numbers there. This is 2006. This is 2012-13. Uh, and the out, outer uh, periphery of, of the range had expanded almost three times over. And of course, this is probably an underestimation because our transex were roads, were, even though they were relatively close together, they were still far apart. We, we didn't capture all the animals. Uh, and using a 10 to 15 year lag phase, um, we calculated an initial, in, initial introduction date of approximately 1970, which is curious because there are no records of hares coming over in that time. Now we're only working with two time slices, which limits things a bit, but nevertheless, it's a rough idea. So then we want to look at population densities. What's actually happening on the ground? Population interactions. And we used random encounter models, which is a model allowing pop de density estimation for species which don't have individual markings, uh, as well as distance sampling for corroborative and uh, comparative purposes. And this is what we got. So each pie chart is a one kilometer sa sample square for random encounter modeling. And as you can see in the core, as with the other graph, Consolidation of European hares, very few Irish hares. Um, in the periphery, uh, split, although there's an interesting one down here where we've got almost entirely European hares, which does suggest the range is much farther south than, than we currently know. But the main thing to take away from this uh, slide are these two graphs. So they both use different uh, methods. Distance sampling, far coarser landscape scale in this instance. Random encounter model, these are averages across one kilometer scale, so they're, uh, they're, more, uh, pardon me, they're more fine scale. Uh, and they both show an invasive species process which is ongoing. So you have areas of allopatry for uh, uh, Irish hare, where, um, right, right out here. Then in the peripheral zone, you have Irish hares at approximately the same density, but European hares in addition. And then in the core, you have a high density of European hares with Irish hares only found in upland areas. And I can say that because I did the research. They're only found in very wet mosaic habitats up in the hills. 
Uh, and then a quick word about hybridization. I won't go into this too much, but over a th uh, nearly a third of uh, samples in that range area were hybrids, which is much higher than any other uh, legomorph contact zone. We got first and second generation hybrids and bidirectional uh, inter introgression. So what do we do? Uh, do we deal with invasive species? If so, how? We have non-lethal measures such as habitat management or uh, fencing and so on, uh, although that might not be effective for European hares. We have lethal options, so ca uh, caging and euthanasia or shooting, or we could just leave them to naturalize, but that has uh, moral legislative implications. Uh, if we do decide to manage in whichever way, then we, it needs uh, a structured governmental program and the support of public and landowners. And we decided to see whether the Irish public were aware of the invasive species issue and what they thought of control of invasive uh, species through a questionnaire stratified across each uh, zone, so core, periphery, wider, and then into two, two tiers. Countryside Alliance Ireland for, uh, were, were good enough to distribute the questionnaire for us to their members, and then the general public, for want of a better term, and that's a bad one for them. General public is very nebulous. Uh, so we took responses, put them into uh, a few models, just to see if we could tease out what predictive responses would en enable other questionnaires to, uh, to get, get uh, an idea of what determines support for culls, or management, sorry, not culls. Uh, and basically, people would support management uh, if they're likely to sign a petition to the government, if they're hunters, if they live closer to the invasive uh, area, and uh, if they're f their affiliations. So Countryside Alliance Ireland members more likely to support management. It's all a bit tautological. It's what you'd expect. But other responses give us some interesting and promising uh, things to take forward to government if, if that was uh, decided to do. We decided to do that, sorry. So both groups similarly interested, uh, concerned about conservation. They would both support various management measures, and they both think the invasive threat is important. Uh, the Irish people are very, very proud of their Irish species, which is certainly something that can be played into with conservation measures. Uh, so across the two groups, 53% said they would control, uh, support control of the invasive species. Does that give us a democratic mandate to do it? Of course it doesn't, it's heavily weighted by one group, and there are far more groups than uh, I have here. And if you are gonna do invasive species control, then you need all these groups right up here. You need, you need uh, support across the board. So, to conclude, thank you for your patience, uh, the Irish hare appears to be a unique, uh, ecologically unique uh, subspecies and may actually uh, represent an evol evolutionarily significant unit. Uh, the European hare is a threat to both the ecological security and genetic integrity of the Irish hare. And if the Northern Ireland, Irish government decide to engage in management, then they need to do a structure, structure, structured outre outreach and community engagement because that's integral to the success of any management uh, program. And, and they are obliged to deal with the species due to national and international legislation to do with protection of native biodiversity. So thanks to all these, all these people who are kind enough to help support me and uh, let me talk. Uh, and do you have any questions? Uh, with the Irish Air, yeah. uh, primarily changes in uh, well intensification of agriculture in Northern Ireland, um, m more uh, manure spreading on fields, which Irish hares are averse to, uh, more um, harvesting for cattle feed, um, and so on. Basically, the way they, tr they use the landscape just became unsuitable for hares, reduced mosaics, and so on. Did you find only Northern Ireland? No, it was Ireland wide, uh, but my, my study. Um, was uh, paid for by the Northern Ireland Environment Agency, so I couldn't go anywhere else. instances in the literature of people reporting European hares and we followed f quite a few of these up and they all, they without fail, I turn out to be uh, like different morphs of Irish hare. Uh, telling the species apart is easy when, when you've got a trained eye, it's easy to get them wrong when the Irish hare is, is, is a bit, has a bit more melanin or so on. So the, as far as we know there's 
this that the apart from one or two animals in the east, uh, west, sorry, of Northern Ireland, and it's a very small number, that is the only robust population. <laughs> Marvellous, thank you very much, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so welcome to my talk. I'm sorry you will hear no empirical data from my side because I'm a 100% theory person. And um, I'm currently a postdoc in Paris. <coughs> and for, the for today, I decided to focus on this question. So if we look at food webs, like abstract food webs, with some kind of evolutionary feedback loop, and these food webs are subject to increasing rates of invasive species. What does it, that mean for network structure and network stability on long time scales? So my talk is going to have two parts. The first part is about evolution of food webs, and only in the second part I will talk about invasive species. So the per first part is just about what is an evolutionary food web model? Now when you look at the literature, you can find several examples, but they're all based on this algorithm. Actually, I didn't know. So um, you start with an initial network. It might be something simple, like only a consumer resource model. And then you add a mutant population. So you have a network, and you just add a new node. And you say this new node is representing a mutant of that node that you already had. So it's similar. It's supposed to be evolution. And then you calculate your population dynamics. That's where you put your competition in there, your feeding interactions, and all that. And then you see whether this mutant population is able to survive and establish itself, or whether it's able to even outcompete others, or whether just all of them survive and the network starts growing. So during my PhD, I developed such a model. And um, uh, yeah, here, here's what you get. So in the, end, in the end, you get evolving networks. So you get food webs where the structure itself is not static. The structure itself can adapt to changing environments, and in this case, to increasing rates of invasive species. So in my case, it works like that. For my food webs, I use the magic trait, body mass, so I can arrange all my species along this body mass axis. In the beginning, I have just one consumer, this one, with a certain body mass, and one resource. And the consumer is eating the resource with this Gaussian-shaped attack rate, so with maximum attack rate right now. It has a feeding center and a feeding range. So I use three traits to characterize a species. The first is body mass, the second is feeding center, favorite body mass of my favorite prey, and the third is feeding range. And uh, then uh, when I introduce a new mutant population, it inherits these traits, so I get a new population, a new node with a similar body mass, similar feeding center, and similar feeding range. And then I calculate my population dynamics. So for each of the nodes, I have a differential equation giving me how does the biomass change over time? Well, it increases due to predation input, and it decreases due to predation loss or respiration. And uh, in this case, my mutant doesn't really have any much to, to eat, so it will probably just go extinct when I calculate these population dynamics. Then I introduced the next mutant, and maybe this one is better adapted to the resource, had a higher attack rate, so higher input, so maybe it's able to survive, and maybe it's even able to outcompete the ancestor species. And uh, maybe here we have a new mutant, and maybe in this case both of them survive and the network starts growing. So I hope that the idea is clear. Now the next thing that I, that I want to present is like a typical simulation run to get you more familiar with this approach. So on the top, you have the number of species. This is the size of the network. It's the, size, uh, the number of nodes in the end. And here you have the evolution of body mass over time. So if you see a line like that one, for example, it means there was a species with a certain body mass, and it appeared here and was able to survive until here. And on the right, you have the initial network with one consumer feeding on one resource. Now we can step through that and see how the network changes. Uh, in the beginning, there's so many open niches in the network, so it grows quite quickly, and it grows even more. Sometimes there's an extinction event, and the network collapses a bit, then it recovers and collapses again, and that's how it goes on forever. So now we have dynamic networks. So we have evolving networks. Now what I did during my PhD is I tried to figure out whether these networks are actually realistic in some kind of sense, or whether they just look nice. And I collected some data from my own model, 
I compared that to empirical data, so a data set of 51 food webs from different places, and uh, it's the food webs where I had the body mass information, and I compared that to a previous model that works with the same alg algorithm, but has only body mass in there. And I, I tried to take networks of similar sizes to, to actually make them comparable, and then I calculated 18 different network properties. And I know this slide is a bit overwhelming. I don't want to go too much into detail. My point is just we compared these 18 different network properties, and we found that indeed these networks seem to be quite realistic. So if you're interested in this approach, and if you'd like to learn more about evolutionary food web models, I recommend these two articles. The first one, this one, is the one where I introduced the model, and the second one is, the, uh, is a paper where I used this model to study biodiversity ecosystem functioning relations. But actually, I didn't want to go too much into that direction because I want to talk about invasive species. So what I presented so far is stuff that I did during my PhD in the group of Barbara Droissel. But about one and a half years ago, I moved to Paris, and I joined the lab of Nicolas Loey. And I'm now part of a project that's called Adaptation and Resilience of Spatial Ecological Networks to Human-Induced Changes. Super long title, but in short, it's Arsenic. And uh, basically what, what I do is I take these models as a tool and I apply different scenarios of global change and I see what happens. So for, that, for today, it's invasive species. And this particular project started as a spin-off of a workshop that I attended a year ago. It was a workshop on community assembly and Lauren was the one who organized the workshop. And uh, during this workshop, I, I met lots of people who work on Hawaii. And this is what I learned about Hawaii when it comes to community assembly. There are basically three processes going on. The first is, well, sometimes there are invasive species coming in from the continents, and this used to be super rare, but now it's happening on an everyday basis. And then second, if these species get in, they start to adapt. And then third, there's also migration, mainly from the older to the younger islands. Now, these people were kind of complaining that there's no good theory on community assembly that actually combines these three processes. It's either only evolution or only invasion, but not both. And then Fernanda and me, we started to think about that. And we thought, it's super easy to do that. We just take our evolutionary algorithm that we already have, and now when we introduce a new node, we just roll a dice. And with the probability P, it's an invader. If not, it's just a mutant. So if it's a mutant, we do exactly the same as we did before. So we pick a parent, a parent node, and we introduce a new node, a mutant node, and these are similar, and this number gives me how similar they are. That's it. If it's inv an invader, we do pretty much the same, but the interpretation is different. So we, we think that the invader is related to one of the local species, and this number Z tells me how related they are. So if Z is a small number, that means this invader is probably coming from a similar island. It's pre-adapted. It's similar to the species that we already have in the network. If Z is big, that means this is something completely strange. It's an alien. And by the way, this is a log scale. So two actually means a factor of 100 in the body mass, for example. So it's really strange. And now we have a very simple model where we play around with only two parameters, P and Z. And we can study this question that I had in the beginning concerning structure and stability. So let's assume Z is fixed, so my invaders are all coming from the same place. They're a bit strange, but not too much. And here we have no invasions, and here we have mutations and invasions. So every fifth in new node is an invader. And you see at first sight, this is different. It seems like the niche base is like more densely packed. And that makes sense. If you imagine there's an empty niche and you want to evolve into that niche with tiny mutation steps, that takes a while. Maybe by the time you get there, the niche doesn't even exist anymore. But as an invader, you can just jump right into that. So it's easy to fill up that space. And that's what we see when we look at the uh, invasion probability. We get bigger networks, and it's especially this, oh, you probably don't see this yellow line. It's supposed to be for the top trophic level, the fourth trophic level. You see it's especially the higher trophic levels that benefit from that. Now we do the opposite, so now we fix the p-value and we play around with the z-value. So now every second new node is an invader, and here the invaders are quite pre-adapted, they come from a similar place, and here they come from a place very far away, they're really strange. <laughs> 
And again, you see that this is different. There's more fluctuation in there. So it seems that these strange invaders, they cause more damage. There's just more turnover in there. And that's what we see here. So if we play around with this degree of alienness, that, or that, I don't know how to call that, so I call it degree of alienness. Uh, and we see we get smaller networks. Um, and again, it's, it's mostly the top trophic level that suffers from that. Now we can do both at the same time. So we vary both parameters. And I start explaining here. So you have the invasion probability on this axis and you have the degree of alienness on the Z, the, uh, Z axis. And the color code gives you the number of morphs in the system. So the network size, how many nodes do I have? And the biggest networks are in this corner where I have lots of invasions, but kind of from similar places. And I think that's a very interesting result. But there's more, because now we can calculate the coefficient of variation of that, which is the standard deviation divided by the mean. And then you get a measure of evolutionary stability, because you get a measure of how big are my extinction avalanches. And you see that this black area here says that the coefficient of variation is the lowest, so these are the most stable system in an evolutionary sense. And we can do the same for the total biomass that the network accumulates. Unfortunately, it's not so clear here, but here again, the most stable networks, this time on an ecological time scale, are in this corner where I have lots of invasions from similar places. Now, this is all a bit work in progress. We're still um, playing around with the model doing robustness checks and all that. Uh, so if you have comments, questions, feedback, data, please tell us. And by the way, I'm looking for new adventures uh, because my postdoc contract runs out in about half a year. So if you're looking for a new colleague or collaborator, please tell me. Uh, and by the way, I'm a bit old fashioned. I don't really use Twitter, but I have an email address and it works. So uh, thank you very much. No, the mutants are usually similar to the resident. So uh, probably they have a smaller impact. Yeah. And there's also a difference between mutant and invader that I didn't highlight, that uh, the um, parents for a mutant are chosen proportionally to their individual density. That means those species with a small body mass, they have high individual densities, they evolve faster. So all these mutations are probably happening on the bottom of the network, where I assume that the invasions happen just everywhere. That's a, another different. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So the question was whether individuals evolve or populations. And um, so each of my nodes represents a population. And when I introduce a new node, it's a new population. And it has a tiny population size. Actually, what I do is I take the parent population, I take a bit of biomass away and say this is something new, it's a tiny bit, and then I see whether this tiny bit can make it or whether it goes extinct. Does it make it clearer? Yeah, but initially it's actually two individuals. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but since it's all differential equation and I play around with biomass densities, I don't talk about individuals, but that's the in interpretation of it, yeah. Please take another question from the back while I stop this off. Yeah. Um, well, that, that's a good one. Uh, it, it's true, so all the species in my model just have body mass feeding center feeding range, and I have no idea whether there's a distribution of that, because I just look at the average adult body mass. So actually, I don't know how to do plasticity in that context, but I think it, it should be done somehow. I guess I have to just say it. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, it's okay. Mine's in the folder. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh. <laughs>
Is yours also? Yeah, I think it's still alive. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, Sorry, okay. I got the wrong <laughs> talk. Do you understand? <laughs> <laughs> My apologies. Um, I just get okay, it okay. different dimensions of Hello everyone, my name is Will, um, and I'm going to be talking to you today about the predatory impacts of non-native coccinellid beetles, or ladybirds. So, I'm sure most of you will know this already, but I'm just going to get us all on the same page. The UK is home to a wide variety of non-native species that, as you can see up here, um, span a broad array of taxa. Um, there are lots of definitions in invasion ecology, and the definition that I'm going to be using today and throughout my project is a species that can both survive, reproduce, and disperse within a novel environment. Um, and this is, was originally used by Blackburn et al. So we have lots of species in the UK. Um, these species can impose impacts, and these can be broken down threefold. First, we have economic impacts. For example, the disruption of aquaculture that can be seen by the sea squirt here. Secondly, we have human impacts, such as bites and allergies. Um, the rather gruesome picture here is from a giant hogweed kind of sap reaction. It's not an allergic reaction, it's a burn. And lastly, we have ecological impacts. So, for, for example, um, loss, of, or loss or displacement of native species. And it's the last of these, the ecological impacts, that I'll be focusing on today. So not surprisingly, there's been quite a lot of work trying to quantify the impact of non-native species. But interestingly, little work kind of tries to take into account more subtle nuances in in-field effects. For example, parasites, which seems counterintuitive as we know that parasites play an important role in community structure. And even more counterintuitive as we know, or it has been shown, that parasites can actively drive species invasions and can play an important part in the actual impact an invasive species can impose through infection. So we set about to measure and quantify and compare one functional trait which we believe could be having a significant ecological impact, and that is predation. So how can you measure predation? We used predatory functional responses. Um, these are the relationships between resource density and resource consumption, the resource in this case being prey. And there are three well-defined functional response types, which I'll quickly summarize for you now have a type one response, which is a linear relationship to the point of satiation, a type two functional response, which is a nonlinear curve to the point of satiation, and lastly, a type three functional response to the point of satiation. Within each of these curves, we can further define the behavior through two additional parameters that define this behavior. These are attack rate and handling times. So we can initially describe predatory behavior as one of each of these three types, we can then compare attack rates and handling times to further tease apart differences in this. So we undertook this method uh, to compare and quantify native and non-native ladybird beetles, both under uninfected and infected treatments, so as to get a full range of impacts to, to better reflect in-field effects. So we then hypothesized that our invasive species would be a better predator and by better, I mean lower or higher attack rates, lower handling times, and a higher overall functional response curve. We, we hypothesized this primarily due to, especially in invasive predators, that being a better predator would further facilitate their invasive species status. Secondly, we suggested that pathogenic infection will reduce predation. Um, this was primarily due to infection having associated physiological and metabolic costs. So in order to address these questions, we used our ladybird study system. So the first player in the story is our alien, which is the harlequin ladybird. This species is native to Asia and was released throughout Europe as a biological control agent. It arrived in 2004 and since then has spread rapidly throughout the UK. It's, slow, it's spread in the UK has now started to slow, but its global spread is still continuing. It's quite a large ladybird, 
in comparison to our native species, and it's a generalist, both in terms of its habitat preferences and its prey. So we compared this non-native species to two native species, the first of which is Azalea bifunctata. This is a native two-spot ladybird. This is smaller than the invasive, about two-thirds the size. And in the five years following the arrival of the harlequin, it showed a decline of about 44%. A similar decline was also noted in Europe. Our second predator is our seven-spot ladybird, Trochanella septumpunctata. Again, this is a larger ladybird, comparable in size to the seven-spot ladybird. This, well, populations in the UK have shown no such decline, and it's still one of our common species. The last player in this story is our pathogen. This is Vivaria bassiana. This is a widespread entopathogenic fungus with a very broad host range, and it's used quite a lot in terms of um, biological control agents against a wide array of insect pests. So how specifically did we go about doing this? We set up a laboratory microcosm experiment using experimental arenas consisting of a petri dish. Into this, we added some water agar to add additional moisture, in addition to providing a substrate for our wheat leaves or wheat blades. The wheat blades added both habitat heterogeneity and a food resource for our prey. We then added our prey, difficult spot up there. Um, our prey were English grain aphids, which are both an economically important pest species and a small prey, which is great for this kind of analysis because it gives us a fine resolution in terms of piecing apart different predatory behaviors. We used nine densities of prey between one and 256 individuals per dish. Finally, we added our ladybird individuals. Each dish received one ladybird. So this was one of each of the species, either one of our native species, the other native species, or our invasive species. Each ladybird individual was then subject to one of two treatments, either an uninfected control treatment or the infected treatment through Bavaria bassiana infection. The predation was allowed to occur for 24 hours, after which time we calculated the number of prey consumed. So this, was a, this gave us our prey consumed and prey density relationships. So I'm gonna run through our uninfected treatment first and then outline the key points from the graph. So as you can see here, there's quite a lot going on, but I'll point out the key points for you. So on the bottom here in blue, we have our native two-spot ladybirds, which is the smaller of our two natives. Hiding under here in green is our native seven-spot ladybird. And on top, we have our non-native harlequin ladybird. So the key points to get across from here are that each of the three species is showing a type two functional response. When we considered our attack rate and handling time parameters, through pairwise comparisons between the three species, at least one of the two parameters differed significantly between each comparison. So we're able to say that pr the predatory behavior did indeed differ between the species, with the harlequin ladybird in having the greatest predatory impact. So as we move on to our, our infected treatment, this is individuals with Bavaria bassiana fungal infection, we can see uh, roughly similar, but also with some slight differences. Again, each species showed a type two functional response. Again, the two spot ladybird, our small native in blue, has the lowest, and the harlequin ladybird, our non-native, is higher than this native. An interesting point is our native seven spot ladybird shows increased variation. So this is much more variation than we saw in any other treatment or species in this analysis that I'm presenting here today. When we compared our infected and uninfected treatment for both the harlequin ladybird and the two-spot ladybird, that's orange and blue, the infection brought about an overall reduction in the predatory impact. For the harlequin ladybird, this was 13%, and the two-spot ladybird, it was 12%, sorry, 18%. So we quantified an important functional trait under both control and pathogenic infection. Each species treatment combination demonstrated a type two functional response with our harlequin ladybird commonly showing the greatest predatory pressure, which we expected as it is an invasive species. Infection through Bavaria bassiana infection brought about an overall reduction in predatory ability, again, adhering to our hypotheses. So what does this show in the greater context? It shows that invasive species can have greater predatory responses than our native species. 
This also shows that pathogenic interactions can change our expected impacts of invasive species, which is really important and a real key point I want to get across here. Which leads us to the question, are our current methods an oversimplification of in-field effects? And is this then important in terms of quantifying invasive species impacts in the field? So moving forwards, I think functional response experiments are essential and a valuable tool in quantifying invasive species impacts, specifically predatory behavior. But I do feel we can add some more subtle and, and advancements which will further advance our understanding and realism that's achievable in the lab. The first of these is increasing habitat heterogeneity to provide both refugia for prey in addition to giving the predators some actual foraging kind of challenges. Secondly, including additional field relevant interactions, for example, pathogens. And lastly, I appreciate this is a bit of a, a stretch and will, but it should be a challenge to introduce multiple predator prey systems within the lab as well. This is another important point. Lastly, the work I've been talking about today is looking at one functional trait, predation, but realistically, this should and could be applied in theory to wider functional traits, such as detritivory, which are also important in many other species. So I hope I've given you a good summary of everything today. I'd like to acknowledge my supervisors, my institutions, and my funding bodies. And if you have any comments and stuff, feel free to get in get in contact. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yes. Um, I think predation plays an important part, um, and I think both in terms of this system and wider predatory invasive species as well. Um, but I do think there's, there's a lot going on in terms of the interactions. Um, more specialist predatory behavior could also be playing a role as well, in addition to direct and indirect competition as well. So I, 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 yeah, I wasn't meaning to give the impression that this is the yeah, I think there's a lot going on and lots of subtle nuances as well. Uh, this might be a question, might be a suggestion. Have you tried looking at um, the consumption per unit biomass of the predator? Um, because it's not surprising to me mm -hmm. that uh, harvested beetles who are larger eat more acres than mm -hmm. they ever have before. <coughs> yep. um, this is something that I have had a preliminary look at and something I want to spend a lot more time looking at. Um, with the methods I've been using, there are slight issues with this that I do want to overcome. Um, that one's going into too many specifics. Non-integers are an issue, um, but there are several other different methods that I want to try and tease apart and get at that question, because I think that is an important point. <laughs> Um, ladybirds don't break down leaf litter. Um, the other side of my project is a freshwater system. So I've just finished a mesocosm experiment looking at, again, comparing non-native and native gamma rids um, with respect to both community change and predation and detritivity behavior. Thank you for that talk. And thank you for coming to the message to over here. Get the right talk this time. Good afternoon. Uh, I think you could say that this talk is similar in context to the previous talk almost. 
Uh, we're adding another, org uh, adding another organism to an invasion and seeing what happens. Um, I'll just introduce myself. Well, I'm from London. I'm, a, I'm actually living. I work in Brazil at the Federal University of Sousa, where we have the largest entomology program, postgraduate program, probably in Latin America. Um, and this is in collaboration with plant pathology in the same department, in the same university, and with a group with the university in Oman, in Muscat in Oman. This is a project funded specifically to look at a problem in Oman, which is uh, witch's broom disease of the Lyme, which is caused by a phytoplasm. I'll show you phytoplasms in just a second, just to show you where Oman is. It's the Gulf of Oman, a small country, there's UAE. Um, this is acid lime, which is a very important crop, pro a very important fruit crop in the country, specifically, especially culturally. There, they're very reluctant to switch to another crop, another type of lime crop. And this is this shows a visit in May in 2013, and then October. So in four months, this tree went from this to this. This is actually a more extreme form of. <coughs> of the disease, normally you get these witches' brooms, um, <coughs> which reduce production and stunt growth and so on. But this is like most likely when it's associated with Citrus tristata virus as well, and you get much much higher virulence. Um, so this is in Oman. It's a huge problem. Has devastated industry. You can say the same in Iran and probably the rest of the region. Um, and we find something very, a very similar pathogen in Brazil. And when we started the project, we found this. This was published in 2014. I'd just like to not point out all the specific bits, but these are a number of phenotypic measurements really here. And just to show that there's no difference between the infected and the healthy plants. This is all plants found in the field in terms of all these things that the, the Phytoplasmids do change, they affect the growth and chlorophyll and so on. So we're saying we can call this an asymptomatic <coughs> pathogen. It's not even, you could not even call it a pathogen, but actually it's not causing a disease as such. Just so, you're, just so you know, that's, this, that's a bacillus, a common bacteria, E. coli, and this is a phytoplasma down here. So they're tiny endo, endo, endocytic parasites, lost loads of their functions, a lot of uh, intracellular parasites have. Um, if you're interested in them, you could you could look up Saskia Holkenhout's work. She's based in uh, East Anglia. Just to show you what they are, they're probably originally animal parasites, so related to mycoplasmids that cause those diseases in cows. Uh, they're taken up by leafhoppers and psyllids, and they get into the hemolymph, so they're systemic and they reproduce in the insect, which probably is derived from the animal origin. As a side note, this, these symptoms of witch's broom and so on may increase the attractiveness to new vectors. So it may be a manipulation, host manipulation, in order to increase transmission, uh, similar to other systems like zombie ants, which we're working on in Brazil. Um, also, phytoplasmids are known, uh, along with some plant viruses, to reduce the plant defenses against insects. They specifically seem to downregulate certain defenses, which increases the vector reproduction on the plant. This is what I'm going to show you in this, this particular system. And it seems to be a common theme in, virus, in viruses and, and phytoplasmids that have a more intimate association with the insect. Just to compare the system in the two, on the two continents, then in Oman we have this witch's broom disease, and also the photo I showed you, which is sudden decline disease. You have two potential vectors, Hishimonas pisipis, which I think is from a bit further east, and the true invasive here, which is Jeffrina citridasian cit citrus psyllid, which is a vector of one of the major diseases of, of citrus, including other, not just Lyme, but is one of the major th threats to citrus production globally, including in Brazil. This insect is in Brazil, as is Wanlongbing, or citrus greening, which is a Liberobacter, so not very different from the phytoplasma. But this one isn't. So what we have is this, these two, uh, sorry, that's Portuguese. Uh, uh, we have these two insects, one, one here, one, um, two here. And here we have these asymptomatic infections. And we wanted to compare these, just to introduce a bit of theory to this, so <coughs> it's hopefully more of more use. 
Where we have parasite vector interactions, where it's an animal host, the interaction between the vector and the, the animal is very brief. Reproduction is elsewhere. Here's an example of Aedes aegypti. Reproduction is definitely elsewhere. And usually the parasite vector interaction is antagonistic. So even though you might think that, that this and, uh, and dengue virus, for example, there's no real cost to the vector, there is. Uh, I, I explored that in a paper in Ecology a while ago. And also just as an example, looked at this with collaborators and Theo Cruz in, in Brazil on kissing bugs that transmit trypanosoma, which is the vector of Chagas disease, and showing that the trypanosome really causes a negative effect to the, to the, to the insect vector. Meanwhile, on plants, there's this very major difference, which is that often the, especially small insects, spend a long time on the plant. So when an, when an insect, when an aphid, for example, a female aphid arrives there carrying a virus, she's going to reproduce there and have, what, another five generations? So she is now in her, her future, her future fitness is intimately tied to the fitness of that plant. And there, the parasite can become a, a mutualist, and that's where you may get the parasite reducing defenses of the plant host. So you get a mutualism between the parasite and the vector. So just as a similar example, you might think of the braconid uh, parasitoid wasps that inject a virus into their caterpillar prey and suppress the immune defenses of the caterpillar. This is a very similar situation of suppressing the defenses. So that was explored in that paper as well. And there's this very nice work by these, this Chinese group looking at that with white fly and looking at this in terms of, of an invasion across China of a Gemini virus transmitted by white fly. And then there's a nice review paper here by uh, this group here from Penn State. So some of these data were shown yesterday. We're going to show them again in a bit more detail. I, I may, you may well not have been there for that. And this is looking at the fitness of one of the insects that's on both continents in both situations. So in a monument in Brazil, on phytoplasm infected plants and uninfected plants. This middle treatment is just one where we added insects as well, uninfected insects, just in case that was having an effect. Okay, thanks. And we find that eggs, there's many more eggs produced on the infected plants in both cases, including where it's asymptomatic. We find survival, these are just survival curves, I won't go into detail because there's absolutely no difference between the treatments in either case. Survival times are different between the different countries, but they're different experiments. But between the treatments, there's no difference. When we get all the numbers together, what we find that's most important is that the intrinsic rate of increase is much greater on the infected plants in both cases. It doubles. So if you imagine a microherbivore with, say, five generations on that plant before dispersal, the difference over five generations is going to be absolutely huge. Um, we're starting to look at the mechanisms of this. Also in Oman, we found these plants around, around the, in, in, the, in the growing areas, which seem to serve as alternative hosts. So we found two phytoplasmas. One of them is plainly not a relative of the one we're working on, but this one and the phylogeny group very closely with the one we're working on. So it seems there may be these reservoirs nearby. And this has just been published, by the way. Uh, and we also did some field work. We monitored, used sentinel plants, so healthy plants were left in the field for winter or spring or summer, so for three months in each case. And we looked at what, what they picked up in terms of phytoplasmas. We got similar data also from yellow sticky traps of insects. What we found is most important is that in the winter there's very little transmission here. Um, taking that in terms of certain, uh, in terms especially of thermal biology, we start just starting to work on GIS mapping to look at infection likelihood and, and based on the insect trapping data. So this we're going to try and send it to Journal of Geography or something. Um, and what it shows is there are areas in Brazil, for example, here, where infection likelihood is, li is greater. So the greener it is, the greater the infection likelihood. So this region here is Sao Paulo, which is one of the major citrus growing regions in the country and where citrus greening is a big problem. And then of course, if, if it threatens Florida, then there are worries and so on. 
and in the Middle East, India, uh, Australia, they have lime production as well, southern Europe. Um, we're just starting to use this to get recommendations for what might happen here. And the key problem here in Brazil, for example, is this asymptomatic infection. No one knows it's there. But it might be increasing the reproduction of that other invasive insect, which we are calling a citrus, which may not be spreading. It may be spreading that asymptomatic infection, which could be a problem if that becomes a pathogen in the future. But the real problem is it's increasing the vector of the other disease, of citrus greening. So there's this silent infection that's uh, affecting the dynamics of a completely different disease. That's perhaps one of the main points here. Um, yeah, so that's Sao Paulo here. And the silent infection, you may get these novel diseases emerging, uh, as you get, for example, with white fly and this Germany virus is constantly evolving. Um, and in Oman, what we're trying to do is imag imagine we're planting potatoes in Scotland. Here, potatoes are planted in Scotland to avoid nematode infection for the sea, po the sea potatoes that go south. So the idea is we may get areas, for example, in the highlands here, where you can plant material that's free of infection for distribution around the country. Uh, because it's a perennial plant, it's very, it's very important to not to have infection from the beginning. And we're hoping to set up a decision tool uh, for that, some decision tools for that to really recommend, make recommendations to the growers. The idea in Oman is that they're not going to have oil in the future, and this is one of the areas they're hoping to invest in, uh, in agriculture. So we'll see if they're able to. Um, so those, that's the summary, really easy. So even this asymptomatic infection doubles the rate of increase in vectors. And this also relates, for example, if you're looking at invasive insects, and you're testing, you're looking at its intrinsic rate of increase on plants, you may be te testing on, on plants in one situation. In the field, it may have a, there may be some silent infection that is actually increasing its rate of increase, which could be important for classical <coughs> biocontrol, for example. So that's that. Associated weeds, looking at these facts involved in transmission and development of decision tools. This is mostly the work of a PhD student in uh, Philip, who gave a talk yesterday, came in at the latter stages, colleagues in these three places here, and funding, and that's my contact if anyone's interested. Thank you. is incredibly poorly run. It's, it's because of this whole system where the Omani doesn't actually, you just got this area where you have Indians who run it. And so it doesn't really bother. And it's really badly managed. The idea would be to try, yes, to try and get it set up <coughs> in the area. But we don't. We haven't done that. Yet. It would certainly something be something to look at. It's not something we've been able to do at the moment. Um, but if, we, if you start to develop the tools to detect these things, like this talk that Philip gave yesterday, then that might be interesting to do.